Hello and welcome to News Now on TV 360. I'm Thelma Okoro. Business activities at Arik Air were paralyzed due to picketing by aviation labor unions. The unions say the action became necessary after Arik Air refused to allow its workers belong to labor unions. Among the unions present for the protest were the National Union of Air Transport Employees, Air Transport Services Senior Staff Association of Nigeria ATSAD, and the National Association of Aircraft Pilots and Engineers. Just last year, a similar protest was held in the office of the airline. A few months later, precisely on February 9th, Amcon took over Arik Air as a result of the airline's bad debt to the company and all the creditors. However, the union says Amcon's takeover has done nothing to ease the troubles at Arik Air. We're here because of uh, Arik management trying to push away union from this environment. And we have our members here, so that is why we're here and the e-treatment that are given to our members. It is not our intention to stop operation, but the management of ARIC is the one that is causing their problem. They call us for a meeting and they renege from the arrangement we have and we have our members here. We expect, we are a responsible union, we expect that when they call us for a meeting, even though if we did not agree, we can, you know, adjoin the meeting and continue over and over again. But for a receiver manager of Ari to come and walk the union out, telling us that we can go to hell, he has zero tolerance in the union here, it's not acceptable wise by the union. In an ironic twist of events, the workers the labor unions claim to be fighting for have distanced themselves from the protest. They state their own protest kicking against the activities of the aviation unions. Displaying placards with various inscriptions, they revealed just how they felt about belonging to aviation unions. Benue State Governor Samuel Autumn says 17 people were killed in the Zaki Biam market attack. This figure contradicts various reports which place the death toll at over 50. The governor in a statement condemned these reports, describing them as inaccurate and misleading. President Muhammad Buhari has already condoled with the victims of the incident. He also directed security agencies to probe the attack. As a result of the president's directive, Police Chief Ibrahim Idris has deployed a special force to the area to ensure peace and security. The Nigerian Senate has confirmed the appointment of 45 non-career ambassadors nominated by President Muhammad Buhari. However, the upper legislative chamber of the National Assembly rejected two of the nominees. They are Sylvanus Unsofo from Imo State and Jacob Daudu from Undo State. The Senate explained that they were not confirmed based on the recommendation of the Foreign Affairs Committee. The Nigerian Senate has postponed its proposed hearing with the Secretary of the Government of the Federation, Babachi David Lawal. This follows a request of the SGF stating that the date contradicts with the date of another official assignment. He had initially refused to, be, to appear before the Senate, citing a pending court case on the matter but backtracked on that excuse. The Senate had summoned Lawal to appear before it on Thursday. The summons follows allegations of corruption leveled against him. The Nigerian Air Force is promoting security documentation for its officials. Chief of the Air Staff, Air Marshal Sadiq Abubakar, says this will address the handling of documents generated in the course of performing official duties in the Nigerian Air Force. He was speaking at a seminar held in Abuja, the nation's capital. It will provide an avenue for sharing knowledge and engaging in an unbiased debates and discussions in line with international best practices. At the end, the workshop will help the service in overcoming some of the challenges militating against effective and efficient document security in the Nigerian Air Force. The objective of the workshop, therefore, is to enhance professionalism by addressing pertinent security issues in handling official documents. The one today is targeted at the airmen and the airwomen. And the focus is on personal assistance and chief clerks 
of all the branches in headquarters in Nigerian Air Force. Chief of Defense Staff Abayomi Oloni Shakin says over $2.6 billion was spent by the Nigerian government to address humanitarian crisis caused by Boko Haram in 2016. Oloni Shakin made this known at a meeting of the Global Coalition working to defeat ISIS in Washington, D.C., United States. He further stated that the Nigerian government is open and willing to adopt policies from the coalition that could further enhance its success story in the fight against terrorism. Troops of the Nigerian army have raided and destroyed an illegal oil refinery at Buguma River State, south of Nigeria. A statement by the army says the operation is to checkmate the trend of crude oil theft, illegal oil bunkering and illegal refineries and all the acts of criminality in the area. Also discovered in the general area were tanks containing crude oil and four cotton boats also containing illegally refined crude oil products. The Nigerian government says reports of a fresh attack on its citizens in South Africa and not xenophobic attacks. In a statement, the country's Ministry of Foreign Affairs said the incident does not constitute xenophobic attacks on Nigerians in South Africa. It described it as a scuffle. The incident took place on the 14th of March 2017 in a motor park in Polokwane in the Limpopo province in which two Nigerians were injured, one of whom has already been discharged from the hospital and the other receiving treatment. It says it has received no report of casualty or death of any Nigerian in this latest confrontation, though some properties were reportedly destroyed in the ensuing escalation. The creative and entertainment industry in Nigeria has become a key driver of growth and one of the most rapidly growing sectors of the Nigerian economy. Now analysts say the cinema business, which is a major part of the nation's film industry, is capable of becoming a major driver of economic growth and job creation here in Nigeria. However, this can only be achieved if the potential is harnessed effectively. It is 2 p.m. on Saturday afternoon and the crowd is beginning to gather at Film House Cinema in Lagos. People of all ages are trooping in to relax and hang out with friends and family. Others buy movie tickets to see their favorite film. The same thing happens even on weekdays. From the early hours of the day to very late at night, the cinemas are usually packed full. This is the new face of cinema life in Nigeria. Like a little man. Here is a briefing. Prior to the advent of the television and home video in Nigeria, cinema was one of the major means of entertainment and realization in the country. The cinema business flourished from 1903 up to the late 1980s. But towards the late 1980s, the cinema culture began to face a major decline, resulting in some of the existing cinema houses shutting down. And by 1999, Virtually all cinema houses in Nigeria had collapsed. But 2004 saw a gradual rebirth with the opening of the first modern movie theater in Lagos. 13 years after, the industry has witnessed a massive growth and expansion and now considered the biggest in Africa. 2004, the modern cinema came back to Nigeria. You know, so we saw this whilst working overseas and we decided that you know, we have the expertise to come and help and add to what was happening in Nigeria. And that's what we decided to do so far. You know, I, I think it's been fantastic. You know, um, a number of people, particularly the business side of the industry people, have come together and, and, and we've joined them uh, to, to build the cinema industry in Nigeria to what it is today. The cinemas have made it possible for the audience to come and enjoy themselves here, but the audience have determined the standards they want. So the producers, Nollywood, has taken that up as a challenge to say, okay, if this is what you want, we're going to give you that. With over 52 cinema centers scattered across the country, Nigeria cinemas are built to meet international standards. The Highmark Cinema in Lagos is one of them. It has the biggest 3D screen in West Africa and seats over 320 people. When we started building cinemas, we built regular multiplex cinemas, nice, the ambience, amazing. You know, let us, I'm sorry, comfort seats, stadium seating, luxurious seating, and then we moved to 3D. And, and, and you know, so when you watch film with your 3D glasses, amazing, you know. Then we also added digital, 
we all moved to digital. And so the films, the picture became crisp, crispier. The sound became better. Then we moved again in this cinema here, the IMAX location, to IMAX, you know? So here, we have, we have premium screens. We have two premium screens with, with extra leg room. Then we have the signature screen, which is like business class on a plane. You know, recliner seats with your table, they bring your food, you know, it's, it's a dining cinema. And then we have the, you know, the cube. The cube is like upper class on a plane. It sits only eight people and you can actually choose your own film. And you can actually lie down, you know, the seats actually change into a bed. You can just lie down with your blankets and watch a film and it comes with your food and your drinks and your popcorn. Then you move from there to the IMAX. IMAX is a completely different class in itself, you know. And the screen itself is four stories high. Four stories high, just think about it. You know, silver screen, 3D IMAX is amazing. Now, regular 3D is when the image seems like it's coming to you and you're dodging. But IMAX 3D is as if you're in the screen. So it takes you into the movie. You know, things are coming from all around you, not just coming to you, it's coming everywhere, you know. And that is the experience. That is what we call cinema experience. You can never get on TV. The influx of modern cinemas in Nigeria is also helping to redefine the standards in the country's movie industry. Producers are not churning out quality movies for the cinemas with budgets averaging between $250,000 and $1.5 million. But the cinema, a lot of people can come out and watch movies with their loved ones or like before you have to stay back at home and do that. And the side that before you put a film out there in the cinema, the quality is very important. So it has also helped the quality of our movies today. And um, it's also <clears throat> the most important part of making movie is putting it out there for people to watch and distributing it. So first off, it creates an avenue where people can come and see this film and pay and see it and enjoy the worth of their money. And um, a lot of movies being churned out today are good quality movies, or like before. And this is what the cinema, um, the cinema business has cost. So it has, to me, I, it, 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 it has a positive impact on the industry. Nigeria cinema industry is now estimated to be worth over $7.2 billion. The making, distribution, and screening of moving pictures has become the country's second biggest source of employment after agriculture. Actually, I, I was serving with, my, with GTB in Lekker Branch, and um, I got hooked up with female staff, and uh, you know, he gave me a link for, to females. And when I finished serving from the banking, after a month or so, so females was actually the only offer I got then, and um, I joined them. So I was working for them as a logistic person. So I make a lot of savings while I was working for females, and I put them together to get a truck, you know. And when I got it, and I, I met with the MD and other people with females, okay, I, I need to resign, I need to stand on my own. Uh, at the moment now, we have about nine trucks, and each truck about two drivers. We have about 23 staff right now. So everything, all of their movement from one side to another, everything has to do with females with their logistic as a date. I handle all of them. Nigeria cinema business is a lucrative venture that has a lot of prospects. And with a population of about 260 million people, Nigeria is a fertile ground for the business to thrive. It is now left to the government and private investors alike to fully harness its hidden potentials. Flourish Alonge. TV 360, Lagos. The Nigerian government has awarded a $1.79 billion contract to a Chinese state-owned firm to work on the second phase of Abuja's mass transit railway. The three-year management contract is the latest in a series of infrastructure projects won by the China Civil Engineering Construction Corps, CCECC. The country has also previously signed two deals worth around $5 billion with the company to modernize and build railways in the north and south part of the country. Now, as part of activities to promote local content development among engineering students, the Nigerian Institution of Mechanical Engineers Lagos Chapter has come up with an initiative called Nemecha Innovation Challenge 2017. The initiative is expected to address issues of capacity building in engineering as well as strengthen the practice and involvement in the growth of the nation. Children, they say, are the leaders of tomorrow. 
in line with this, the Nigerian Institution of Mechanical Engineers, in conjunction with the Royal Academy of Science, African Catalyst 16 to 17 Award Grant, have selected six schools to take part in the Innovation Challenge. This was made public on Wednesday at a symposium organized to challenge the students on ways of developing their knowledge. Actualize the growth we desire in agriculture, we must embrace technology. And technology comes in different forms. It could come as formulation, it could come as machineries, it, it could come as equipment, it could come as manpower development. So it comes in different forms. They have a lot to do. You know, the young at heart, they, they, there's nothing to trouble them now. So they have all their attention, and then with the basic principles they learn from school, they can actually make tremendous impact when it comes to technology. The minister has tried a lot. He has already given the Nigerian Society of Engineers, which I am one of them, the mandate to go and even submit any research, anything in which the, our association they are working in, we are working together with the government, with the minister. Now I'm saying, why don't we look for ways of using solar or wind, mainly solar though, because we have sunlight a lot in Nigeria. So that's what my, my speech was all about, looking at that and also trying to encourage the students to see how they can educate themselves, get better acquainted with the technologies available right now. With, uh, I mentioned there about Elon Musk and how he has, his company now has gone from just making um, cars running on batteries to looking at a world where we don't even have to depend on, um, on fossil fuel. So basically meaning that you can use sunlight to charge batteries and those batteries can power your cars and all that. Chairman Lagos State Chapter of Nimeki, Fumi Akimbagbun, said the association intends to support the discovery of original ideas and local solutions to identifiable problems in agriculture, power supply, renewable energy, and automation. Oh, we have already uh, arranged that already for them. We are running a grant with the Royal Academy of Engineering to power this project. And for today, we'll be giving some tokens to the students to start a demo of this uh, prototype of, of the ones that, have won, that we have selected. We'll be giving them money to run a prototype. And the next one month, they should come with the prototype. They will now select them and give them money for fabrication also. So everything is financed for because we have asked for support. We are going to empower six of them today and we will still be encouraging some of them to submit more submissions where we'll be able to take, but we want to empower 10. This challenge is the first of its kind in Nigeria. We set the standard for more competition discoveries and cross-sector collaborations in the future. Ulu Oluju, TV360. The Nigerian government has been urged to set up technology that will ensure the adoption of organic agricultural produce by the local farmers here in the country. This was a major topic at the front burner of a one-day organic agricultural produce export forum. The speakers at the event held in Lagos in Nigeria can save close to one trillion naira annually from food importation if farmers imbibe organic agriculture. The key speaker, Michael Griffin, said Nigeria needs to be focused and pragmatic in its economic recovery initiatives. To obtain the organic certifications for my Ghana farmers, that in itself gave them a higher standard for their product. And then from that standpoint, we then moved their product into the United States uniform because everything in the United States is organic. Go organic, go organic. And the reason why is because a lot of the people who actually eat these foods are very food and health conscience. So with that being said, that helps Nigeria put form a new product, put, put forth a new uh, uh, attitude as far as the development is concerned. It's going to increase our export bid. That's why I said it's going to reduce our import bid because we, you have to understand that most of the food we eat in this country, 80% of them are being imported. So we are trying to reduce this kind of system that where we can go into the export driven rather than the import driven and if you are spending over a trillion naira a quarterly to bring food to the country then we're, we're in problem that's why we keep on saying that there's no point for uh, countries like china that's over almost two billion populations and india of over one billion population we go to them to come and feed our nation when our nation is just under 200 million but with this kind of initiatives we really have to improve on our export 
drive. And by so doing, our the organic food product we are talking about will be able to gain grants in the in the world. It was about four billion dollars that Nigeria was able to access out of that algorithm because we do not understand uh, we do not understand how to move our produce. Now we talked about Dole, Demante, Kisita. These are the big companies, big players in agriculture in America. What they do is they move products from uh, Costa Rica, uh, Mexico, and Ecuador to the U.S. under a unified name. It's a program that has been set, a well-organized program, so that this produce can uh, uh, move into America. And again, you know, America, they are very high on food security. You are deceiving another customer just like you deceived us. The same way he deceived us. Eh? Why? Eh, Tony Shay. Boba Kura o le jeun, o le o le o le jeun. Boba Kura o le jeun yi ami. Boba Kura o le jeun. Workshop bu mi le le yi. Ebe te ba ti nche. No ti nje. Ye lo pe ni workshop. If you don't have to work, ni ko ma ti shop. Ewo, you cannot base your business on lies. Go down now. It is corruption and it cannot work. Not in my country. Welcome back. Up next, we have business news with Fidelia. Thank you, Thelma. Global rating agency Fitch on Wednesday says Nigerian banks will face more challenges this year, even after the difficulties of 2016. Fitch made this known in its peer review report where it said the outlook for 2017 wasn't much brighter than that of 2016. According to the report, Nigerian banks will continue to face extremely tight foreign currency liquidity despite authorities' best efforts to normalize the foreign exchange into bank market and improve the supply of dollars in the market. Nigeria Central Bank plans to sell $100 million in currency forwards on Thursday to be delivered within the next 60 days. The bank has been injecting more dollars into the system to meet the needs of importers since February 2017. Now, the CBN has been trying to boost supply in the market and narrow the margin between official and black market rates. The local currency Naira closed at 4 10 to the dollar on the black market, although it weakened to 307.75 to the dollar on the interbank market. Nigeria's debt office said on Thursday that it raised 2.07 billion naira from a new two-year savings bond intended for retail investors. Nigeria's, Nigeria forecast a budget deficit of 2.36 trillion naira in 2017, half of which it aims to fund through domestic borrowing. Now, according to the debt office, it offered the bond to help broaden the country's funding base. Oil prices hovered above four months low reined in by investors' concerns that OPEC-led supply cuts were not reducing record U.S. crude inventories. Brent crude oil was trading at $50.49 a barrel, while U.S. crude slipped 18 cents to trade at $47.86 a barrel. Now, the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, and non-OPEC state had agreed to cut output by 1.8 million barrels a day to the middle of 2017. While OPEC has broadly met its commitment to reduce output cuts, non-OPEC producers have yet to fully deliver on pledged cuts. Well, that's all on business. More stories coming up. Don't go away. That was a very good uh, business. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, the furniture you, you, you brought was very perfect. <laughs> that's how we roll. <laughs> uh, because then let me do you uh, receipts. Yeah. How much of it again? Uh, uh, one million naira. Okay, write 2.5. Umbano. 
the deal was <laughs> for one million naira now. Okay, write three million. I'll give you five hundred. M O no. I doesn't do business like <laughs> like that now. Oh. Yeah. Hey, that case, give me back my check. Let me go and look for someone that understands business. Take. Oh, oh, oh. Your loss. Ah. Okay. It is only for incorruptible customers. What are you talking? Now get out. What, what, what kind of this? You, you will just die. No, 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 no. You that will die. That, that is the door. Now get out of here. Rubbish. Look, my people. Make me only add money for original invoice price. That's not corruption. Say no. Not in my country. Corruption not in my country. Welcome back. The Islamic State has claimed responsibility for the terror attack which left four people dead and 29 injured in London. Eight arrests in London followed Wednesday's attack, the deadliest the country has experienced in over 12 years. The attacker drove a car along a pavement on Westminster Bridge knocking down pedestrians, creating panic and leaving dozens injured. He then ran towards Parliament where he stabbed a man who was unarmed. He has been identified as Khalid Mansu, the 52-year-old man. Addressing the UK Parliament today, Prime Minister Theresa May revealed the perpetrator was British-born and once linked to violent extremism. A terrorist came to the place where people of all nationalities and cultures gather to celebrate what it means to be free. And he took out his rage indiscriminately against innocent men, women and children. Mr. Speaker, this was an attack on free people everywhere. And on behalf of the British people, I would like to thank our friends and allies around the world who have made it clear that they stand with us at this time. In addition to 12 Britons admitted to hospital, we know that the victims include three French children, two Romanians, four South Koreans, one German, one Pole, one Irish, one Chinese, one Italian, one American, and two Greeks. The threat level to the UK has been set at severe, meaning attack is highly likely for some time. This is the second highest threat level. The highest level, critical, means there is specific intelligence that an attack is imminent. As there is no such intelligence, the Independent Joint Terrorism Analysis Centre has decided that the threat level will not change in the light of yesterday's attack. And while there remain limits on what I can say at this stage, I can confirm that overnight the police have searched six addresses and made eight arrests in Birmingham and London. Mr Speaker, it is still believed that this attacker acted alone, and the police have no reason to believe there are imminent further attacks on the public. His identity is known to the police and MI5, and when operational considerations allow, he will be publicly identified. What I can confirm is that the man was British-born, and that some years ago he was once investigated by MI5 in relation to concerns about violent extremism. Mr Speaker, yesterday we saw the worst of humanity, but we will remember the best. We will remember the extraordinary efforts to save the life of PC Keith Palmer, including those by my right honourable friend, the member for Bournemouth East. And we will remember the exceptional bravery of our police, security and emergency services, who once again ran towards the danger, even as they encouraged others to move the other way. Mr Speaker, a lot has been said since terror struck London yesterday. Much more will be said in the coming days. But the greatest response lies not in the words of politicians, but in the everyday actions of ordinary people. For beyond these walls today, in scenes repeated in towns and cities across the country, millions of people are going about their days and getting on with their lives. The streets are as busy as ever, the offices full, the coffee shops and cafes bustling. As I speak, millions will be boarding trains and aeroplanes to travel to London and to see for themselves the greatest city on earth. It is in these actions, millions of acts of normality, that we find the best response to terrorism. A response that denies our enemies their victory, 
that refuses to let them win, that shows we will never give in. Ten members of Egypt's security forces were killed by bombs which struck their vehicles in central Sinai. A military spokesman said the security forces killed 15 people and arrested seven others during the operation. They also found and destroyed half a ton of TNT explosives and seized two four-wheel vehicle cars containing hand grenades and hundreds of mobile phones. Moving on to sports stories, now reserve goalkeepers Ikechuku Ezemwa and Daniel Akweyi were among the final arrivals as the Super Eagles prepare for their friendly clash against Senegal on Thursday. The two goalkeepers arrived on Thursday morning, easing the pressure on coach General. The team had been troubled following the failure of the two goalkeepers to arrive early and injury to the first choice of goalkeepers, Kao Ikebe. The team will play Senegal on Thursday evening in London. Niger's league management company has released a new set of rules to curb crowd violence during football games in the country. In a memo to clubs, the LMC directed that clubs must now put in place all the safety requirements such as having trained stairwards at all stadium entrances. It also demanded the establishment of functional public address systems which should be operated on mud days for announcement. Finally, the LMC says clubs should only sell tickets to persons who have valid permits such as match tickets, workers' identity cards and passes. UEFA coach, UEFA chief, I beg your pardon, Alexander Seferin says he will not sanction the German official who took charge of the Champions League second round clash between Barcelona and PSG. The French champions held a strong 4-0 lead heading into the second leg of the clash at the Camp Nou but crumbled to a 6-1 loss. The referee Dennis Aitken received intense criticism for his performance, especially for the controversial awarding of two penalties to Barcelona. PSG had filed an official complaint against the referee, but Saffron says UEFA will take no disciplinary action against the coach. Well, that's it on news now. Thank you very much for watching. I'm Thelma Okuru.